afternoon. It is 12 o'clock here in Arizona, 3 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, where Greg is in Michigan. I have Greg Harden with me. If you don't know who Greg Harden is, you probably haven't like read my book, which you should read my book, <laughs> because Greg has been an influential voice in my life, consistent voice in my life, who I met at the age of nine. Um, Greg Harden is University of Michigan's athletic department. He's noted as the secret weapon and he's the senior executive athletic director and director of athletic counseling with 33 years of mental health experience, wellness experience under his belt. So he's life coach, motivational speaker, executive consultant, best known for his work with MVP Desmond Howard. 23-time Olympic gold medalist Michael Phelps and six-time Super Bowl champion quarterback Tom Brady. And I am just so appreciative for him taking the time out. Thank you, Greg, for taking the time out to talk to me. Um, you were the secret surprise <laughs> for the book tour when I was supposed to come to Michigan. However, it did not, it did not go live due to the COVID and everything, which understandable. So I still appreciate you having this conversation and in light of everything that's happening in our culture, I felt it was important to bring such a, a strong voice on to also give us some tips and have some conversation. So welcome. Well, thank you. Um, first, let me make it very clear how proud I am of you. I've always been proud of you in terms of how hard you try to create your own definition of who you wanted to be. But I'm extremely excited about what you're doing now, looking at your evolution into a, a role of a specialist, an advisor, a consultant uh, on this matter that is so important to so many people. So I'm just uh, so impressed and so proud of you uh, because I really have known you since you were nine and you were snot nose, and you were uh, a bully, and you were, <laughs> and you, you were a pretty intense personality. And uh, for you to deliberately and intentionally change your life, uh, it speaks volumes about who you are and how much God loves you. Thank you so much. Thank, yeah, <laughs> for sure. And honestly, when you mentioned that, like you, you're accurate in every way you described me back then. So true. How is it that, so a lot of people see, see the behavior and, and look to behavior modification, but for you, you spoke life into me. Like, even though I was a tough personality to deal with, you spoke life, that life, those seeds that you planted were different from what everyone else was saying to me which essentially helped guide me on this journey that I'm on right now. And for me, it's like, I appreciate it, but there are so many people who are not blessed with that. What is some guidance that you can give to those who may seem those, those, those knucklehead or hard personalities to deal with, to get to the root of that, to still see a future outcome and to speak life? Well, I mean, first, let's, let's back it up to what did I see? And what I saw was a kid who was extreme in their reactions to everything. I saw a kid who, uh, playing a, in playing a game, uh, lost I mean, the anger that you expressed just from you're losing to a 30-year-old person <laughs> in a pool game. I mean, I shot left-handed. I did everything to... You're going to tell this story, Greg? Sure. You're going to tell this story? Uh, yeah, to, we're shooting pool. Well, and I'm in there, and like she told me how good she was, and, and I probably wouldn't have played as hard left-handed if she hadn't to start come in bragging him about how good she was. <laughs> and she was good, uh, and uh, and it was competitive, and we had a great time. I had a great time, and then when I when I accidentally won. She was, can I say pissed? Yeah, you was like pissed. <laughs> yeah, she was pretty peeved. She was pretty upset. And, and, and you could see um, there were signs of extremes. The reaction was so extreme that I thought 
it, for whatever reason, I was able to see you. I was able to see that you were not a typical nine-year-old, that your, uh, your self-esteem was on the line in, in a simple game with, a, with an adult. And you expected uh, to win. And if you didn't win, it wasn't like you were disappointed that you lost. You were mad and took it personally. And that's, I mean, I was stunned. But it gave me a clue that you were struggling with something. And so it's really important that people can uh, see in, in others. I, I didn't even know you, but I instantly knew that you were struggling. I didn't know what you were struggling with. I didn't know why, but I knew that you needed someone, hey, slow, slow down. It's not that deep. It's not this monumental of an event. You remember that? I remember all of it. I remember all of it. And I was so, I wanted to cry. I think I did cry. I was so you angry. Cried. <laughs> you were so angry. You cried. That was, that was a clear sign. I mean, and so with people in that sort of scenario, you simply want to open doors to them to talk about their anger. And one of the things I, I think I did with you, I believe it was so long ago, but I believe one of the things I did with you was ask you about what you thought about other kids who were act, who act the way you were acting. And you, and you had zero tolerance for anyone that was acting the way you were acting, which was so, so interesting because you were so clear that people that act like that are suspect and they need to, they need to check themselves. I said, Tiffany, I'm talking about you. Oh. <laughs> and so you have to get, and, and, and we began to just talk about, you know, how there may be some alternative ways to, to, to play games to have fun, to understand that loss is not, uh, should not be a devastating moment. Yeah, that's good. One of the things as you, you had a, you, you were the voice that even though I was upset <laughs> and I was pissed and I didn't like what you were saying though, I respected your voice though, because you, related to me like i'm i'm from detroit and i'm telling you now the way you keep acting people won't be able to hear the message in which you're trying to communicate through all of that and you have a, a course that you in a seminar that you talked on about self-defeating attitudes and behaviors can you given can you talk more to how you were able to help put me in these, put me in the room, put me at the table of these conversations that helped me as a teenager in the importance of that? Well, let's, let's, let's help people understand that nine-year-olds are more, more coherent than people give them credit for. I, you know, you were, you, you didn't want to be coached, but you were coachable. You, because you were so smart that if anybody made sense, you would at least listen to and you may not have liked what, what I said, but you took it and, ex and, and examined it. So by the time you're 13, 14, we had a, a friendship. And it was built on the fact that every now and then I would talk to you, but I would talk to you as though you were not a child, but a coherent thinking thing capable of processing information. And because you were, you were old, so you acted like you were 30 years old when you were 10, 11, and 12, uh, you thought you were grown and, and were everyone's equal, every adult equal. So I said, okay, if that's how you see yourself, I'm going to talk to you like you. You say you, you, you know what you're doing and, and, and what you think. Well, let's talk about who you are and who you want to become. And no one had talked to you about who is it that you want to become. What kind of person do you want to be? Can you plot, plan, scheme, and dream on becoming a woman of substance. Because you you knew you didn't, you want you wanted to be different, but 
you didn't know what it would take and you allowed me the key piece is allowing people to help you you allowed me uh to help you and as your confidence in in our relationship grew you were more open uh to 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 what we were talking about but then you shift into adolescence and now you're surrounded by adolescents in peer groups and you talk about shifting you know and i know that the peer group becomes more important than any group on the planet. So all of a sudden, you now are proving yourself to everybody. And Josephine Badass becomes dominant because you are going to not be a victim. That was one of the, one of the reasons that you are so good at what you're doing, and so invested in helping others. There was a part of you that rejected being a victim at an early age. Mm. I found out later on that that is what you and I had in common. So you've shared that at 14, 15 years old, you wanted to be different. You had a conversation with your uncle and when he asked what you want to do, you you were like different. <laughs> and you, you mentioned that you didn't know what that looked like either, but hate was consuming you um, from the ages of 18 to 25, where you were your own worst enemy and ego was in the driver's seat. And at 25, you had to go back to 14 year old you. And I too had to go through that journey at 24 because being in corporate, it will, you got to do some work when it starts showing. Can you talk to what that process looks like as a man and also just being able to be comfortable to realize, to tell yourself the truth and realize that not everyone else, not everyone is the problem. It, sometimes it's you, but for well, the better version of you. Let's put it in context and let's make it real easy, buddy, and put it in the context of contemporary reality. You got to understand, we're talking about a period of time that I grew up that matches what you're looking at right now. The race and the hate that hate made was consuming. And so I wasn't just uh, 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 ego-driven. I was pissed off and angry. And, and racism was so dominant that you had to take a position. Uh, it took me years to appreciate Martin Luther King. Now, it took me years to appreciate Jesus because I thought they were soft <laughs> and too kind-hearted. And so uh, because being, being a victim was not going to be an option. Uh, I, you know, at sit-ins, I was the guy who was going to ride around and make sure they had something to eat. I wasn't sitting in. <laughs> I was going to get ride around making sure that we monitored the police radio and found out what they were doing. So we, I just, I, I, I put a high value on uh, a, a peaceful protest, but it wasn't me because I was too pissed off and, 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 and the stuff that I had experienced uh, with uh, police and, and going down south and, 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 and I saw the uh, whites only, colored only. I saw the signs. And it's, it, as a child, as six, seven years old, I'm like, what's going on? And so while you can always make excuses for why you were the way you were. Anger and, and being filled with hate altered my, the child in me who was real clear that I was a citizen of the universe and the world was wonderful. It was beaten out of me uh, by society. And, and, and everyone was recruiting, as I indicated, recruiting you to, to, to fit in. Uh, pick a side, pick a politic, uh, to uh, uh, either with us or against us. And so uh, making it through that period and try, uh, we've got to help people understand to get through what we're going through right now. You've got to have a clear vision of who you want to be and not let the, 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 the politics of today um, in the, in the division that's being perpetrated at the highest level uh, sabotages your dreams. So I have big dreams. 
I had big dreams that I wanted to be something special. And I was distracted. And I was consumed by uh, how are we going to change um, the world that we live in. And by the time, by the time I am uh, in my late 20s, I said to myself, God, if I live to C25, because my lifestyle was such that living to C25 was going to be me. And I said, I made a promise. If I live to C25, there must be some purpose. So at 25, I had made a, a commitment and a promise. When 25 hit, I said, oh, snap. <laughs> I guess there must be some purpose for my life. And it's time that I set aside everything else and focus on trying to pursue purpose. That's powerful. That's powerful. And so in do in pursuing purpose, what did that what did that process look like? And what do you say to encourage others right now who are who are growing up now in the age frame of like the millennials and where it the anger it's okay to be angry but don't let it consume you and also putting your mental health as a priority during this season as well because with june being ptsd awareness month also you have these triggers that are also coming up like aj and i have had consistent conversations since all this happened of even his run-ins with the police and unfair treatments. And then there's my brother and my mom is, you know, all those different components. How do people not hate, not um, also take their mental health into consideration and seek that, seek those steps out to so not. Tiffany, you just asked me 25 questions. Sorry. So I thought, be yeah. Real clear. So, <laughs> let's pick it apart. Where do you want? Where do you want to start? Let's start uh, with your process. <laughs> well, uh, the, the, and I think we should because uh, you've heard it all your life. You've got to have purpose. Well, like, okay, well, what's my purpose? How am I supposed to figure that out? Yeah. Well, I sat up and I made a promise to God that I was, if, if I make it, I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to, there must be some purpose. Now I got to figure out what my pur purpose is. The first thing I came up with was to pursue purpose. My mm -hmm. first purpose was to find my bloody purpose and to deliberately, intentionally begin to examine and, 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 and experiment and, and, and discover what I liked, what I didn't like, what, what was, I was passionate about, what, what, that was, what intrigued me. So you begin to uh, put yourself out there. You've got to take risk to find purpose. You've got to be willing to fail. Those who are not willing to fail rarely succeed. You've got to be willing to, to, to try stuff out, to experiment. And, and, and so my first sense of purpose was, you know, to be passionate about finding out what's going to be, what's important to me. What is my why? What stimulates my, my, my being? What makes me want to get up in the morning? What can help me understand the difference between happy and joy? Happy is temporary. <laughs> happy is like conditional. Joy is unconditional <laughs> and is a gift from God. But that's just my opinion. Uh, so that's a response to that question. You had other questions. You remember? Yes. <laughs> right. And giving tips to not let the hate consume you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the most important piece to that puzzle is, like you said, you must feel your feelings, but not always follow them. You must know what you're feeling. You must be mindful and aware. You know, mindfulness is, is caught on to, and people are starting to understand that they've got to be in tune with how they feel, how they think.
think what, what pushes their buttons. So first you've got to increase your awareness of who you are. Then you've got to be so committed to uh, um, trying to understand that hate is all consuming. The hate that hate may, now you may have a legitimate reason for thinking that hatred is, is, is the solution, but it's not a solution. The problem with hate is that it consumes the hater. The person you're hating, the group you're hating, they, they ain't changed. <laughs> hating them is not changing them, but it's changing you. It is twisting you inside. It is, it is boring holes into your spirit, into your soul. It is eroding your, your capacity to love and to give and to, to experience an amazing adventure called life. So that's why, and that's how you begin to put into context that hate is too much to give an idiot. <laughs> that's too much emotion. That's too much investment because you have to invest in hate. Am I right or wrong? You're right. You, you, you got to dig in. <laughs> they hate a fool. They hate a group. Boom, boom, boom. And it consumes you. And once you understand that it has the potential to destroy you from the inside out, you, you reject it. Yeah. That's good. That was a good answer. I mean, I'm just telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, it made sense to me. <laughs> it, it's, it, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Agree, agree. <laughs> and so with that, a big component is, I feel, your mental health and what I, I use the analogy garbage in, garbage out also because your in Proverbs, it talks about whatever is in your heart, that is, that is who you are. And then taking your thoughts captive, that, that goes into your mental health. Like mental health yes. is wealth. And yes. we as a culture sometimes have not really embraced that. And that was one of the things you were consistent in telling me from a young child. I never even heard of counseling before you go get go to counseling go to counseling <laughs> every it was like every time we met oh by the way go to counseling and you 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 need a perspective you need a voice a safe space that's different from your own from your family to give like to again like you said feel those feelings but i think i would like for you to talk more about the importance of the mental health especially with what we're going through right now in our culture uh, you got to understand that people don't want to talk about mental illness. But we can get people to at least consider talking about mental health. And if you don't want to talk about mental health, then talk about mental fitness. So how I try to educate people is most people, if, if, even if you've never been in shape in your life, you have seen somebody or know somebody that's been in shown up shape, right? And so what are the characteristics of those who are physically fit? Well, if I, if I came from another planet and I've never under, seen uh, uh, human beings and they're talking about uh, health and fitness, I'd ask them, well, what is physical fitness? And of course, uh, the human would say uh, being having cardiovascular uh, capacity to have muscle uh, to be able to engage your muscles, uh, to have strength and, 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 and to be able to uh, endure and, and have stamina. Uh, and if you're really uh, fit, you're flexible and uh, you're capable of, uh, of, of, of enduring tremendous amount of physical stress. And, and until they say one word, they still don't understand fitness. The one word that's missing in many people's conversations about being physically fit is recovery. Because mm. when you're in show enough shape, you can give everything you've got, rest for a minute and a half, and do it again. <laughs> when you're in show enough, show enough shape, you can, you can exert yourself, push yourself, 
and then repeat it over and over and over and over again. Look at Olympic athletes. Now, that gives you understand exactly what I'm talking about. And let's talk about you know, people like to talk about Michael Phelps. We're talking about being in four, five, six events. <laughs> you know, in, in, a, in a two, three day period, recovery. When you're in show enough shape, you recover faster than the average person. Okay, where are you going? What's mental thing? <laughs> we can come up with all these definitions of mental fitness and mental health, but if you want to take it from my perspective, it means that you, 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 you're going to be like, if you're human, you're going to get knocked down. You're going to have sadness. You're going to be uh, uh, betrayed. You're going to have to survive uh, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. But when you're, in, when you're mentally fit in pursuing mental health, you know you're going to get knocked down. You try to land on your back looking up because you know you're getting up. I think that was Les Brown who said that. You, you know you know you're getting up. You're committed to getting up. And you know that you're going to recover. And so to be able to bounce back, to be able to keep pushing yourself in spite of what's going on. It doesn't mean you aren't hurt. It doesn't mean you aren't disappointed. It doesn't mean you aren't sad. You acknowledge it, you recognize it, you get over it, you keep moving. If you can't get over it, you get help. You learn to ask for help. Now, if you don't know how to ask for help, you better, you better ask somebody to help you figure out how to do it. And if you think you're strong, if you're strong, you're strong enough to allow somebody to give you some support. That's good. If you're strong. Yeah. If you're as strong as you say you are, you know that you're not the smartest person in the room all the time and that even you need help. So asking for help and having somebody to talk to, you got, and let me, let me help people who are struggling with counseling. I don't need a counselor. I'm going to ask you a simple question. How much uh, do you think uh, the CEO of Amazon is paid annually? Okay, Domino. Any, any, I don't care. GM. I think this, the woman at GM, I think, makes like $26 million <laughs> <laughs> annually. So if we're paying her, him, $26 million, $6 million, $4 million a year, do they use consultants? <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm paying you $26 million and you got to talk to somebody? Why does somebody that makes that much money use consultants? I'm asking you. Because you want to make sure you're guided in the right way. You don't want to just haphazardly make decisions that are going to impact other people in other places of the business based on your biases. And, and I don't know everything. I'm yeah. running an organization that's got 300 layers. I'm an expert on three. <laughs> I need input. So what I try to get people to understand is that you can, a counselor, a therapist, a clinician is a consultant. <laughs> Hire them. If you like them, keep them. If you don't, fire their ass <laughs> and get another one. But you know you need input from somebody that can see it from a different perspective. I can see if everybody that's listening or, or thinking about this, I want you to look around the room. If other people around you, look at those people. Now, look at yourself. I can't. I have to sometimes ask other people, what do you see that I don't see? I've got to have somebody that's going to ask me questions to increase my ability to see myself even more clearly. So counseling and pursuing mental fitness takes us to mental health, and we are able to 
not live in a fantasy world that I might not get sicker than someone else and I may be mentally ill. There are solutions for all of the above. You can get help for all of the above. You cannot transform yourself sometimes by yourself. You need help. That's good. Another component that you talk to me about all the time <laughs> is get your butt in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> and also in some cases I've heard speaking therapy will not work. Some men, and in, ca- in some cases with men, they don't want to go to therapy, but martial arts works. And you talked a lot about, I remember the art of war and jujitsu. Why are, are, do you have recommendations for other alternatives to therapy and to counseling and why is it like for just saying that layer right there? Cause you used to talk about it and I never understood why it was so important. Why the counseling aspect and also the fitness part was, okay. is, are equally as important. So impl- implicit in what you're saying is that uh, there are people who are, are not going to do well in, 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 in the counseling settings. And, uh, and things that should be done that are better than over traditional therapy. That's not accurate. They can complement therapy. They can enhance your growth. It can increase your capacity to evolve because there are three levels of fitness physical, mental, and spiritual. If you work in all three, you increase your chances of being a peak performer, of being the best possible version of yourself that you can create. So if I cheat in one, the other two will not be fully developed. And so I don't, everybody doesn't want to be an athlete, but everyone should have a commitment to stack the deck in their favor to live longer (laughs) as long as they can to understand the family legacy if diabetes if heart disease is in your family then you have a chance you have data that says i need to commit myself to a different understanding of my body so i think martial arts is an addendum to in addition to therapy and counseling. And again, we can, let me help you out with the counseling piece. Some of the people, high performance individuals you described, when you talk about me, they weren't in counseling. They were in coaching. I'm coaching them to, uh, to be mentally stronger than the average person. I'm challenging them and pushing them. So even if you think you don't need counseling, you need coaching. You need to allow, allow. Tom Brady allowed me to support him, to train him, to coach him, to push him. Michael Phelps has been real. He is talking about a game changer in terms of taking away stigma around mental health. Michael Phelps is preaching and teaching and and recruiting people to go into counseling and therapy because it changed his world, his life. But that's not how he came in to see me. He didn't want to see uh, a counselor. He, 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 I had street cred with Michael Phelps. He walks into my office, picture of Tom Brady, <laughs> Desmond Howard, Charles Woodson, you know, the swimmers that he, he knew their names are, are, are all over my wall. He said, oh, so he walks in and he knows I don't give a darn <laughs> that he's got all these medals. Oh, that's nice. Have a seat. You know, <laughs> who are you? What do you want to talk about? What do you do besides uh, uh, win go- Olympic gold medal? <laughs> who do you want to be? What if you have 
the power and the influence to change lives, what would you do with it? Ain't nobody talking to Michael Phelps like that. So understand that it's not always just you need to go to counseling. You need to have people to talk to. You need to have someone that can hold you accountable. You need to have somebody that can buy, and you need to recruit people and give them power and say to them, if you see me tripping, dipping, and slipping, it is your job to tell me I'm out of control. Because the more successful you are, the fewer people you'll have that will call you out. The the more intense you are <laughs> and powerful and dynamic you are, the fewer people are going to say, hey, I don't agree with you. You've got to teach people, train people, and give people permission who you know will not abuse the power. Bro, Tiffany, <laughs> you know, this, this, this ain't cool. So, um, the martial arts piece is ex ex extremely valuable. Uh, uh, it gives you a vehicle. Everyone doesn't want to do martial arts, and, but you need to understand there's a wide range of martial arts, including MMA, which is a whole different, but they're, they're soft styles, hard styles. They're styles that are, are, like, move, are, are like yoga. If you don't want to do martial arts, study yoga. If you don't want to study yoga, study stretching, running. If you don't want to do any of those, find something that, that triggers for you that will give you an understanding of how to move your body, how to be in control of your body, how to control your breathing, how to be able to rebound and recover quickly from a mistake and keep moving, how to be victorious and, or, or lose and have the time of your life. You want to be in that person that even when they win and beat you, they say, dang, I don't ever want to see you again. God, I just want you. Could you be on my team? <laughs> I know we won, but playing you, oh, I don't know how we won, but I love your game. I love the way you approach it. You, you're the one of the best competitors I've ever met, and I hope I never see you again. And if I see you again, I know I better be ready. So win, lose, we're talking about giving 100%, 100% of the time, win, lose, or draw. And being happy that you gave everything you had. It doesn't mean you go always win. But even when you lose, you had the time of your life because you gave everything you had, and nobody can say you did. That's what I do. I love it. I love it. I know you have a, a hard stop coming up. So I want to just say thank you so much. You dropped so many wisdom nuggets <laughs> on here. And I just, again, I appreciate all of who you've been to me. And I appreciate your voice, your consistency, and being the first ones to speak life into me, which I am a product of you as well. You can add my name to to your Come list <laughs> as well. <laughs> you hanging out with in tall cotton. Man. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we just try to be like you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. And um, we'll definitely have the replay available um, for, for those that may have missed it. But I appreciate this. And from the feedback, everyone saying thank you so much for sharing. Uh, your knowledge and wisdom and thank you so much for your perspective this is amazing amazing coaching so thank you so much for taking the time and uh we'll talk to you soon all right my friend all right up the good work that you're doing it is crucial and important work especially during a time like this covid mm -hmm. has exposed a lot of, of, of truth about what some households are, are dealing with and uh, the sort of information that you're sharing, uh, your commitment, especially to the children, is something that uh, I, I, I just, it's hard to put in words how important this work is and what it really means to know that you are in the forefront. Uh, your book is amazing. You're amazing. Thank you. 
Thank you. Talk to you soon.